most abundant resource on the planet. Water. The most abundant resource on the planet. Water. Water. The most abundant resource. The most abundant resource on the planet. Water. The most abundant resource on the planet. Water, the most abundant resource on the planet. Water, the most abundant resource on the planet. Resource, water, the most abundant resource on the planet. Water, the most abundant resource on the Water, water, the most abundant resource on the planet. The most abundant, the most abundant, the most abundant resource on the planet. Water, the most abundant resource on the planet. Water. Most abundant resource on the planet. Most abundant resource on the planet. Water, resource, resource, water. Water, resource, resource, water. Water, the most abundant resource on the planet. Water, the most abundant resource on the planet. And they have the nerve to charge a dollar fifty per bottle at 7-Eleven. Gormley and other corporate media. You can be listening to this either live on Facebook on Sunday nights at around 6.20 Thunder Bay time or on Twitch. I am now broadcasting on Twitch, so if you are on Twitch, you can definitely come say hi. And the reason why, uh, other than just trying to broadcast on as many different media platforms as possible, uh, I, that I mentioned Twitch this week is that there's a function of Twitch that I've been meaning to try. 
and that is the RAID functionality. And the idea being here is that if there is another channel that is Creative Commons or free culture or anti-corporate media and willing to keep that flame alive, there is a function in Twitch called a RAID where you can basically kick all of the people who are currently listening to you on their platform to another show. Kind of as a halfway point between streaming media the way that it used to happen on TV and the way that it happens on the internet in places like YouTube or Netflix or streaming sites of choice. I, that being that in those cases, it's the algorithm, the particular software that Google runs or YouTube runs that chooses what you listen to next rather than the person you're listening to, I, in the case of Twitch, or you in the case of just listening to MP3s or videos generally on a computer. Of course, back in the TV days, in the commercial or even non-commercial radio days, it was usually some kind of like an editorial decision by the company who ran the station, maybe the DJ, maybe the person who controlled what you were listening to, what you would listen to next. And Twitch has this like nice happy medium middle ground between the two worlds. And so it's, it's an interesting thing and something I'd, I'd like to play around with. So if there's a channel on Twitch that's broadcasting when this show ends in about 45, 30 minutes, then please do come into the Twitch channel at twitch.tv slash themusicgod1 and say what channel you want me to raid because I will do that for you. And that is of course not the only thing going on in the world right now. We are living through a global pandemic and the numbers in Saskatchewan are still some of the lowest in the world. Some of the, we here in Saskatoon are one of the least hit places. And just like looking at the Saskatchewan government's website, they have it split up into, oh, I think it's like 13 or 14 different regions. And the numbers are like zero, one, zero, five, three, zero, one, everywhere in the province except for Saskatoon, the city that I'm currently in. And that's, those numbers have been steadily increasing over the past couple of days from practically zero and now we're at 19, which still is not too high. And I've heard rumors that it's all travelers and people who have not been staying home and not been self-isolating after going to Alberta or Manitoba or wh wherever else you manage to travel in this crazy day and age. And people who aren't taking it seriously and are getting COVID and then bringing it here. But it's kind of interesting that it's this city right now that is the problem here in this province. And so I have been, over the past two weeks, mostly staying home. I've been still working and stuff, but I've been really trying to keep to myself a little bit and not at like the full self-isolation level, just kind of getting out enough to be, keep my sanity, I guess. I'll let you out there, the listeners, judge how successful I've been at that. But the point of bringing this up is that I think a lot of people are, at this point, starting to forget that this is still an ongoing issue, at least in places like Saskatoon, where we really still should be social distancing, we shouldn't be grouping together in large groups of over let's say 15 people, and there are not just laws and regulations in the SAS party plan, the reopening plan, but there's kind of a level of responsibility as individuals that we have to not be grouping together in large numbers. And I think a lot of people right now are starting to get to the point where they think that, oh, this is over and we don't have any cases here and the cases we do have, it's no big deal anymore. And yet the numbers are crawling up again and they're crawling up again precisely because people are not taking it seriously. So it's worth pointing that out. And that's kind of where we are in the current pandemic. We are still in the reopening stages. Schools, I have driven by one of the elementary schools in the city on my bike a couple of times, and it looks like they have begun to run. There are lots of kids running around and what looked like teachers supervising them. Nobody in masks, nobody social distancing, everyone staying in close proximity to each other. And the kids look like they're having fun and all, but I do have to wonder how long this is going to last if COVID is in fact spreading here as the numbers kind of suggest that they are. And the there's definitely, as mentioned on the previous week, it, it's kind of the political issue of the day of how this is going to go. Whether or not the school boards are going to be able to get away with just for the most part business as usual and the current plans that they have and how much of the consequences of that are going to percolate up through the political system by the time the provincial and civic elections happen, including the school board elections, and as well at the federal level as well. So one of the things that's going on this past couple of weeks 
is there's been a lot of talk about the Trudeau federal government and the, especially since O'Toole was elected as leader of the Conservative Party here, that the Conservative Party is really pushing for an election or pushing for their chance to be seat or at least remove Prime Minister Trudeau from power. And from their perspective as the official opposition, they're trying to build this kind of narrative. And I've seen it from a couple of people. So it's, it's not just like a one person making this mistake and kind of buying this line that it's up to Aaron O'Toole to cause the government to fall. Of course, if we go back and look at the outcome of the last federal election that caused our current minority Trudeau Liberal government to happen, the seats that are distributed allow for uh, three different options for the Trudeau Liberal government to continue to govern this country. They can either work with and get the votes or support of the Conservative Party, i.e. O'Toole and his now whipped party, which so O'Toole is saying quite openly that he's not going to support Trudeau in a confidence motion, so there's that's off the table. But there's also the Bloc Québécois and the NDP. And the NDP supported the Liberal in the last confidence vote. They asked for two or three things. One was a national pharmacare program. One was uh, 10 sick days and to work with the provinces to make a mandatory nationwide 10 paid sick day for every employee of the country. And three, to do something about COVID, or at least the unemployment situation that COVID started to cause once it began to cause it. Now, we saw that. CERB was put into effect. One of those three things were met, but only the one. Right now, if you are working at a minimum wage job, as many people here in Saskatchewan are, if you try to take a sick day, if you're even allowed to take a sick day, you don't get paid for it. It is not mandatory, unless you're part of a union and have collectively bargained or are skilled enough to have, as an individual, individually bargained for paid sick time, there's no need for people to pay sick time legally in this province and in other places in Canada. And so I have taken sick days over this year, both as to self-isolate when it was legally required of me, as well as in other situations. And I personally would have been able to call on that paid sick time but of course was unable to because the Liberal government did not live up to that budge to the NDP after the last election, and especially after COVID started to be a national issue, uh, to live up to that. Similarly, there is no pharmacare program in Canada right now, at least nationally, despite promises by the Trudeau Liberal government to implement it by at some point. And of course, you could always say, oh, we're going to implement it next month, we're going to implement it next month, it's taking a while, we're going to do it later, we'll do it later. And it's been long enough now that the session is over. The, the government has gone into a state of prorogation that is going to basically end this session. And we have run the clock completely down. And yet there is no pharmacare program in Canada. There's a little bit of money set aside in the budget that the NDP can definitely get credit for. Uh, having forced the Trudeau Liberal government's hand, but we don't have a pharmacare program. And there's no sign of it being in the wings or being just around the corner. It's just as much of a pipe dream as it's been since the days of Jean Chrétien, who also promised such things in the big book of liberal promises known as the Red Book back in the early and uh, late 1990s. So it has just become another thing that the Liberal Party administration, in this case under Trudeau, has been able to promise but not deliver and to wave in front of the NDP in order to get their support to keep them in power and then just walk away from it. And so now we're in a situation where we got headlines like, quote, nothing off the table, unquote, quote, as the NDP calls on feds to provide a $2 billion infusion for child care. Uh, this is from a week and a half ago, I guess, in August 22nd, where uh, Jagmeet Singh was, quote, wants Ottawa to ante up with an immediate $2 billion cash infusion to provinces to support child care and families during the economic restart. And, quote, we are not taking any option off the table. All options are open, Singh told Canada's National Observer on Friday. Quote, our focus, though, is fighting for people, and in this particular case, making sure families, and particularly women, get access to childcare. We will leave all options on the table to achieve that end. And you can see in what the NDP is doing right now, they've published a petition to try to get childcare. They're trying to organize political support for push for cheaper and better deal for childcare across the country. And yet, there was a push a year ago for pharmacare. And there was an agreement made, and a promise made, that we would have pharmacare by now, or at least in the wings. And that is not materialized. 
So we really have to wonder, with all this movement being made to ask for childcare and more billions of dollars for childcare, is it going to be easier to obtain this because it's a mere just throwing money at the problem issue? Is that what it's going to boil down to rather than creating an entire bureaucracy around childcare? There is a requirement to make a bureaucracy to have a federal childcare program of the kind the NDP was certainly calling for, but will it be just the liberal plan? Will it just be money thrown at the problem? I don't know in this case. But either way, we really have to wonder what reason we have to expect that we'd get this if this is what's being asked for. And if we, the last thing that was being asked for, we didn't get. So I think that what's very likely to happen is that the NDP is going to come to an agreement with the liberals on this. The liberals were going to put money into childcare anyway, so they aren't really losing any face by agreeing to the NDP demands on this. And we're going to see another term of NDP supporting the Trudeau liberals as a consequence. So has Trudeau screwed up the COVID response enough that people are ticked off at him enough to demand the NDP not support it? I don't think so, especially in the NDP side. I've not seen any, or I've seen very little support for looking down on the liberals in their COVID response, in part because there has been some success. One of the things that I encountered this week is through, oh, Next Train. Uh, Next Train is a website, I've mentioned it before, linked to it before, where it's a analysis of the particular COVID strains that are being tested and like for example we've got one in Singapore on August 21st that someone got COVID in Singapore they got DNA tested they sequenced the particular virus RNA that they had and then fit that in in the big puzzle of how it's been evolving since the very first uh, instance of COVID and the reason why I bring this up is one of the reports that they have and they in addition to publishing these really nice beautiful trees of dna data they also have a, a couple of reports of the current status of not just covid but other diseases as well and one of the findings of this report is that canada has more or less successfully kept one of the strains of covid from infecting people in canada it is a success and to the extent that the Trudeau federal government has managed to pull this off, they do deserve credit for that. The European strain, the strain of I believe it's 20B, is just not present here. It's present in really, really small numbers, not even enough to see it at the, at the global level at all. We do have COVID in this country. We have a COVID problem in this country. Thousands of people still have it. It's still spreading, including in places like Saskatoon. But we know that some of our means of stopping it, including things like social distancing, washing hands, wearing masks, etc., is working because we don't have the same distribution of all of the strains that you see in other parts of the world. We have blocked one of the strains. And the other strains are still here, still spreading, still evolving, and we're still struggling with those, but we can kind of measure that, at least to that, the extent we've stopped that one strain, there is that little bit of success to be worth finding out. So a comment from the peanut gallery is that you can't see my face. Uh, interesting. I don't know why there's no video preview here. Oh, it's probably because of the light. I can probably turn the lights off. I don't know if that's any better, but the, uh, <laughs> this, this of course being a podcast, so it's not super important what my face looks like uh, today. But so it, it is worth pointing out though that there is this difference in how Canada is faring in this pandemic versus how the world is faring in the pandemic versus how Saskatoon's faring in that respect. But even with that little bit of success, the country is still beset by cases. We still have open borders between provinces. We still have a closed border with the United States to some extent. We're still allowing international travel. We're still, there's all these choices and changes and trade-offs that have been made. And some of them, it's debatable on, on which ones we should keep, which ones we shouldn't. But certainly we could judge the people who are making these decisions for the consequences of them and whether or not they're living up to what they could be given the choices that they're making. And the fact that we still have cases at all is not to the credit of the federal Liberal Party here, as much as being north of the United States and their giant dumpster fire of cases might impact that. We still have cases here. It's still a problem. It should have been dealt with by now. But uh, on the topic of incompetence, though, it's not just the question of COVID that we can judge our politicians and how much and how they wield power, etc. One of the things that I've noticed this week is the SAS Party website, sasparty.com. If you go to it using Google Chrome, and maybe this is my setup, I'm interested to see if this is replicable in other people's setups, but uh, 
the if you just go to sasparty.com in a Chromium browser, one of the things you'll see very quickly is that quote, your connection to this site is not fully secure. Attackers might be able to see the images that you're looking at on this site and trick you by modifying them. And it's apparently the SSL certificate for the site is valid. They do use some cookies to track you, or at least to manage your settings on the site, which I don't know why they would do that. And then it shows some site settings. But I have not been able to go to see which images are not SSL encrypted. It presumably is possible to find out exactly what resources are being loaded on their website that are not securely being loaded. I just haven't dug that far into that yet. But it's interesting though, that the people who run this whole province, with a majority government even, uh, can't manage to have a secure website. And that everyone who goes to their website might very well be being compromised as JavaScript is injected into their resources or images are loaded with some kind of exploit to target particular viewers and that sort of thing by middlemen, which in the case of the SAS party's website, there probably is some points along the way where you could inject such things uh, between their website and you, the viewer of this show. So it's kind of interesting that we've got this level of incompetence at the level of our provincial government. I mean, my website, it's not secure at all in the sense of there is no SSL involved, but of course my website's also available on Tor, so it deals with that problem in that way. Um, but still, it's, it's worth pointing out. And that's not the only technical snafu going on this week. A large portion of the World Wide Web went down this week due to a outage by a company called Cloudflare. And I've been promising talking about Cloudflare for some time. I really should have got to it by now. But the... And this one's actually like a bonus because it's not just Cloudflare that was out, but also a company in the United States that I am fairly familiar with <laughs> called CenturyLink. And so from Cloudflare's perspective here, quote, today CenturyLink slash level three, a major ISP and internet bandwidth provider experienced a significant outage that impacted some of Cloudflare's customers, as well as a significant number of other services and providers across the internet. While we're waiting for a post modem from CenturyLink, which We'll see when that comes back. I wanted to write up the timeline of what we saw, how Cloudflare systems routed around the problem, why some of our customers were still impacted in spite of our mitigations, and what appears to be likely the root cause of the issue. And they talk about how at 10.03 UTC, quote, our monitoring systems started to observe an increase in the number of errors reaching our customers' origin servers. These showed up as 5.22 errors and indicated that there was an issue connecting from Cloudflare's network to whatever our customers' applications are or wherever our customers' applications are hosted. Cloudflare is connected to CenturyLink slash level three among a large and diverse set of network providers. Pause. So obviously not large and diverse enough because their being out impacted them so heavily. Anyway, continuing on. When we see an increase of errors from one network provider, our systems automatically attempt to reach customers' applications across alternative providers. Given the number of providers we have access to, we were generally able to continue to route traffic even when one provider had an issue. And pause, yet people had issues on that day. And not only were a lot of websites down, but I noticed even just basic internet routing through SASTEL, there were packets being dropped. And now was that the packets going into CenturyLink and then being dropped at that point? That part I'm not sure, but it's interesting to note. So automatic mitigations. In this case, beginning within seconds of the increase of 522 errors, our system automatically rerouted traffic from CenturyLink slash level three to alternative network providers we connect to including Cogent, NTT, JTT, Telia, and Tata. Our network, or our NOC, was also alerted and our team began taking additional steps to mitigate any issues with automated systems that were not automatically able to address beginning at 10.09. So they were on it within six minutes, which is not bad. That's pretty quick. And we were successful in keeping traffic flowing across our network. Uh, so, and then they show some graphs of like, the drop in traffic, the automatic increase of other systems. They show one graph here that it's showing the number of 522 errors, which is practically an exponential drop off. And then finally going back to zero when the crisis issues ended after about four and a half hours. And uh, then they kind of go in from there. So quote, why did the errors not drop to zero? Quote, Unfortunately, there is still an elevated number of errors indicated we were still unable to reach some customers. CenturyLink slash level three is among the largest network providers in the world. As a result, many hosting providers only had a single home connectivity to the internet through their network and quote, to use the old internet as super highway analogy it's like having only a single off ramp to a town if the off ramp is blocked there's no way to reach the town this was exacerbated in some cases because century link slash level 3's network 
Network was not honoring root withdrawals and continued to advertise routes to networks like Cloudflare's even after they'd been withdrawn. In the case of customers whose only network connectivity to the internet is via CenturyLink slash level three, or if CenturyLink slash level three continued to announce bad routes after they'd been withdrawn, there was no way for us to reach their applications and then continue to see 522 errors until CenturyLink resolved their issue around 1420, four and a half hours later. And they show a picture of the CenturyLink map in the United States of their, quote, CenturyLink availability. And it's basically the whole of the United States, wherever there's people, outside of about California and some parts of Nevada. There's basically nothing there in California, so that's kind of interesting. But otherwise, it's pretty huge. A quote, a CenturyLink is available to an estimated 49.3 million people, making it the third largest residential DSL provider in the U.S. by coverage area. In addition to DSL broadband, CenturyLink also offers fiber, copper, fixed wireless internet service. Its fiber service is available to approximately 9.6 million people, making it the fourth largest fiber, third provider of fiber broadband in the US coverage area. Copper is available to 6,941 zip codes, and its fixed wireless is used by 1,000 people. So this is a huge network with tens of millions of users that suddenly has issues and people aren't able to access resources across the internet when those occur. So they have a theory of what happened here on the CenturyLink side relating to BGP and so they have the idea of what is causing it, et cetera, et cetera. But the point here and the reason why it's worth bringing up other than like a North America wide internet outage is that over the past couple of years, CenturyLink and more importantly Cloudflare has been the go-to for an increasing percentage of the World Wide Web. And an increasing amount of the use of the World Wide Web is basically communicating with this single company, this single entity, and then from there they direct the traffic to your website that you're trying to go to. And so there are still big companies and big entities that probably don't use Cloudflare all that much. Like for example, Facebook, when you view this video through Facebook, it's unlikely that they're involved. Facebook's big enough to not have to use a company like Cloudflare, but more and more websites are choosing to use Cloudflare. And the consequence of that is that if and when Cloudflare has an issue, or as we saw this week, if any of their network providers have an issue, like CenturyLink, then suddenly all of these websites who use Cloudflare are unavailable. Now in this case, they were able to jump on it within the first couple of minutes and start to get things back up and running again. And they were able to move fairly quickly into deal with the situation as it occurred, but there's no guarantee that they're, first of all, that they'll be able to continue to do that, that they'll be able to continue to successfully mitigate the issues they have there's no guarantee that they will use their position as a central point of failure for much of the World Wide Web and that they won't use it to their advantage by blocking out their political opponents. They have a history of doing so already, even though the, the particular political opponents that they've been choosing to target have been the kinds of targets that usually get removed from platforms first, and so not a lot of people are defending them. But even so, they've already crossed that bridge. They've already gotten to the point where they're willing to editorialize and control the content that goes on their network rather than just be a neutral intermediary. But there is this risk that they could just go down. And when Cloudflare goes down, and when suddenly all of these websites go down with them, that is a huge percentage already of the World Wide Web and is becoming a larger and larger piece. It is conceivable that within the next couple of decades, that if we do not stop putting all of our eggs in this one basket, we are going to get to the point where the whole of the World Wide Web, or at least enough of it to be permanently broken, could be put in that one basket and could break at the same time. And we got a taste of that this week with this August 30 outage and this uh, CenturyLink uh, issue. But this is not going to be the last time this happens. And Cloudflare has already had issues close to this scale before, but it is becoming a bigger and bigger part of our life, unbeknownst to practically everybody. Who among you, like of the friends in your life, how many of them who aren't computer programmers and who aren't NetOps engineers who actually know the name of Cloudflare, even though they run a huge percentage of the websites that you visit on a day-to-day -day if you use the World Wide Web at all. And so it's a danger that we're walking blindly towards 
And what could we do to stop this? What, what could we do to, to minimize this risk? Well, one thing we could do is just like stop signing up companies and websites and charities and governments and hospitals and all these different groups to this one company to have and look for alternatives to start talking about how to coordinate the use of resources and technology at a global scale that doesn't involve everyone using or at least a critical mass of people using this one company. Running your own website and having your own server. The argument is made that, oh, if you run your own site and run your own server, bandwidth is going to be so expensive and you're going to be DDoS offline, and there is a risk of that. But at the same time, the alternative risk is relying on something like Cloudflare and then having everything break at the same time rather than just being at risk of things breaking up as an individual. There's a resilience involved in having a million different websites that all hosted on their own. Of course, it's becoming easier and easier for the people to DDoS, including companies like Cloudflare, to possibly behind the scenes target people who are standing out and trying to do their own thing and running their own server. There's literally billions of Internet of Things devices being produced and connected to the Internet that are going to be compromised and going to be able to take part in such DDoS attacks. So it is an ongoing problem that we definitely need more thought, more resources, both at the individual level, but also at the social level, too. Like, this is something our communities should be talking about at the community level, that our hacker spaces should be starting to think about, if they haven't already, that cities should already be beginning to address this. Like, this is the kind of issue that should be percolating up to larger and larger organized communities and political entities because there is this systematic risk that is building and building as we trust more and more of our lives to this company. And why are you not hearing this elsewhere? Why is Jeff Cliff the only main voice saying this right now? And it turns out, for the most part, I am one of the lone voices saying this right now. There is a Cloudflare Tor project on Coburg, and that is mirrored in other places that I've been involved with over the past couple of years. But there's very few people involved with it. And we, though we take pull requests from practically anyone who will send us a pull request, it is still not nearly enough people involved. So we could always use things like translators and editors and so on. So that went down this week. Uh, what else did we see this week? Oh, the uh, Ninth Circuit in the United States had an interesting case. Let's see if I can load the details here. This is from privateinternetaccess.com. Quote, federal appeals court finds the NSA's mass surveillance of American phone records was illegal. Quote, the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit has just ruled that the NSA's bulk collection of Americans' phone records was illegal. For years, the NSA has conducted a domestic mass surveillance program on Americans' phone records with little or no resistance from other arms of the government, but lots of resistance from civil liberties and privacy advocates within the states. Pause. So, at first, going back two or three decades, the NSA wasn't even really admitted that they existed. The way that it was referred to is no such agency, and that there, it wasn't even admitted to by the rest of the U.S. government that such a department, such a branch of the government existed and was involved with anything at all. Uh, it was just like a secret black budget program, a place that was for sure something was going on in the background in regards to the U.S. intelligence agencies having the capacity to spy on their enemies, having the capacity to spy on the Soviet Union, and so on. But it wasn't really clear exactly what they were doing or how they were doing it. And the details were kind of hush-hush. You had authors and journalists and uh, people who write books like The Puzzle Palace, which I still haven't read. I'd really like to read that someday. But that sounds like it's one of the books that kind of details before the documents were really available to the public of what was going on, what was going on. Yeah. But you couldn't prove it. There was so much mystery and secrecy surrounding the NSA that there was little you could do other than guess that, oh, hey, they probably are listening to phone calls. They're probably listening for keywords. Like if you say the word bomb on the telephone, it was thought that that would trigger some kind of a recording of your conversation, maybe. Or there was, I think it was... Was it Stellar Wind? I'm, I'm blanking on the, the name of the program. But there was a program for a while that was run to that effect, and little details like that would seep up, but it wasn't really clear how exactly the NSA was involved and the reality of it and all that kind of thing. 
And after 9-11, after the Patriot Act was signed, and it was beginning to be more and more clear that there was a system of mass surveillance. It wasn't just someone does something bad or someone's suspected of doing something bad. And so the law enforcement starts listening on their specific phone calls, maybe with a warrant, and tries to specifically understand what a uh, maybe a, a organized crime group does and how they communicate and what they're saying. Or maybe someone who's planning to commit a terrorist attack and there were agreements, international agreements at the UN and international treaties that governed how terrorism was going to be dealt with. And some of that involved some surveillance of the people involved. And there were individuals who were going to be expected to be targeted as a result of this. But what was never supposed to happen in a free country like the United States and Canada was all conversations, all phone calls, all of our private communications were never supposed to be listened to. We're never supposed to be monitored. We're never supposed to be acted on. There was always supposed to be this expectation of privacy in Canada. There was always supposed to be this ex expectation of the division of authority between the private life and the, of individuals and what the government was supposed to be doing in the United States. That there was supposed to be a line. The rule of law required warrants. They required some kind of reasonable suspicion that something illegal either had happened or was going to happen before someone could be just spied upon by the government. In the 70s, there were cases of the government in the United States and elsewhere that had clearly gone too far for the public at the time. The Watergate scandal, the spying on political dissidents by the US government, and the spying on the Democrats by the Republican-controlled government and vice versa. There were enough things going on along those lines that laws were put into place to protect individuals from the power of the government and their technology that they had at the time, which was still fairly primitive, from being able to watch their every conversation. And yet, after 9-11, we began to suspect more and more with the Patriot Act that there was this mass surveillance system going on, and that it was just a matter of proving it to the court in the United States that this was going on. So there was a court case called AT&T versus Hepting in roughly 2004, where the various privacy advocate organizations and civil liberties organizations and groups like the EFF tried to bring a case to the United States to prove to the court that there was this mass surveillance system going on, that the NSA was involved, and that th there were laws being broken, and that the privacy laws that the United States has, or had at the time, were not being abided by, that there was people who were innocent of any crime whatsoever being targeted by a system that was watching and monitoring their conversations. But that court case failed because at every point where it was required of the government to verify what they were doing, the government had the same response. National security, we're not talking about it. It involves national security, we're not talking about it. That's a national security detail or a national security related detail, we're not talking about it. And the judge accepted that argument. And the judge in that particular case allowed for the U.S. government to get away with saying, oh, it's just national security, that's as far as it goes. And so the people who brought the case could not prove beyond a reasonable doubt or to whatever level of burden of proof that was required at the time to say that there was, in fact, mass surveillance happening. Everyone knew it. Everyone talked openly about it. There was, it was an open secret that the government in the United States was doing this, but nobody could prove it to a court, to the level of standard of evidence that was required until September 2, 2020, this particular story. So, continuing on, quote, in the same tweet announcing the breaking news, the ACLU commented, this ruling, which confirms what we've always known, is a victory for our privacy rights. In the court opinion, Judge Berzon wrote, quote, we conclude that the government may have violated the Fourth Amendment and did violate the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, i.e. FISA, when it collected the telephony metadata of millions of Americans. Looks like that's a misquote or maybe a mistype, but anyway, continuing, quote, this is not the first time that this has happened, but the privacy climate has changed a lot since the last time. In May of 2015, a New York federal appeals court ruled that the now infamous Section 215 of the Patriot Act could not be interpreted to allow the NSA to collect domestic phone records in bulk. Despite this court decision, within a month, Congress passed the USA Freedom Act, which extended the phone mass surveillance program until 2020. 
And it's worth pointing out, that was in the Obama age, that one of the first things that the Obama administration did is pass retroactive immunity to the telephone companies who were involved in this mass surveillance system, that if they ever got caught and it was ever proved in a court case like this, that they wouldn't suffer any consequences to allowing the U.S. government to spy on their customers. And it's interesting that both Congress and the Obama administration specifically acted so quickly to close our availability of a right to privacy, or at least the availability of American citizens to a right to privacy through the NSA kind of being slapped in 2015. So anyway, continuing on, quote, Congress was still convinced that letting the NSA conduct mass surveillance on phone records was in their best interest. Of course, that's totally up to the American public, right? Being shackled with a mass surveillance system and being required to have the government listen in on your phone conversations at all time, uh, that is something, of course, that can be organized against. And people can vote against Congress critters and senators who participated in voting for the USA Freedom Act. It would be an interesting thing to see who exactly did vote for that act. And actually, I'm going to like, put the Google. HR 6172, USA Freedom Act, uh, reauthorization of 2020. That looks like it came up fairly recently. It looks like it's March this year. And well, they have votes here. Uh, record vote number 92, passed. Okay, let's see about this. Votes 20, 29, 8 on HR 6172. And it's split within parties. So 126 Republicans voted for, 60 voted against, 152 Democrats voted for, 75 against, one independent voted against, so it passed. Where is Biden on this? Where is his uh, support network? Where is his party on this? They are split at best and certainly not helping things. So uh, let's see, continuing on, uh, which extended the mass surveillance program until 2020. So the NSA phone surveillance program was both legal and a waste of money. Earlier this year, a report from the government's Privacy and Civil Liberties Board was declassified and revealed a damning analysis of the efficiency of the domestic phone surveillance program created under the Patriot Act and revealed by Edward Snowden. Pause. So this is an important point. The reason why we're having this court case and the reason why we're able to get to this point where it's been proven to the burden of proof required in the U.S. legal system is because of the actions of Edward Snow and his stealing of documents from the NSA and providing it to journalists who, in some cases, have abused the fact that he gave them that data. The Snowden archive was destroyed, and so it is now difficult in retrospect for members of the public to consider what exactly was shown to be the case and what exactly the the watchers are doing to us, and more importantly, their limitations. That was one of the, the big benefits of the Snowden revelations is that it showed what they were capable of and what they couldn't do. And so in this case, quote, in four years, the government spent over $100 million bulk collecting phone records of citizens and have pretty much nothing to show for it. Pause. So in other words, it cost them $100 million, which, I mean, the NSA has lots of money to throw around, probably more than any of us other than the insiders really understand, but they have a finite amount of money. And there is some pressure to keep costs under control. Not a lot of pressure, but a little bit. And so there is this like level of what they can accomplish with that much money. And so $100 million for all of the phone records in the United States. And what did they get for it? Quote, despite all fake rhetoric to the contrary, mass surveillance does not prevent terrorism. Just months ago, the program was up for renewal again with the USA Freedom Reauthorization Act, which did not pass, but is expected to rear its ugly head again. Interesting that it must have been just like the first vote that passed and then the second didn't. But anyway, continuing. But it's expected to rear its ugly head again in the coming congressional session, i.e. after the current elections that are happening in the United States. There is a choice being put to the American public whether they want more of this sort of thing, more mass surveillance or not. And it may not be the case that it's an easy decision just in terms of, well, vote against the Republican, because that might not actually be how to get mass surveillance in the United States. I mean, it's, it's difficult, it's a hard call to choose who to vote for at the different levels of government, because there's only really those two choices, unless there's a compelling independent choice. Uh, someone like the Bernie Sanders, etc. But it is worth pointing out that this is a choice being put to the American public to investigate how your representatives have voted on this particular 
bill on the Patriot Act on mass surveillance generally. And is this something that the media locally in the various electoral districts is allowing? It's worth taking a look. But anyway, continuing on. Quote, hopefully the, this federal appeals court really marks the final nail in the coffin of bulk phone records collection by Section 215 of the Patriot Act. The thing is, now that the uselessness of phone records and mass surveillance has been laid bare, Congress is moving to update surveillance laws to allow warrantless collection of internet records instead. Pause. They're already doing that. They're going to continue doing phone record surveillance. There's really no reason to expect why they wouldn't. Uh, the oversight, there is oversight there, but it's going to take more than this particular court case at the Ninth Circuit to stop them. And on top of that, they're going to take it to the Supreme Court. Like, you can bet on that. So we have not seen the end of this at all. But, quote, the battle against domestic surveillance by the NSA and other three-letter agencies is far from over. However, these legal winnings hopefully set the groundwork for pardons to key whistleblowers such as Edward Snowden. Upon hearing the news, Snowden tweeted, quote, Seven years ago, as the news declared I was charged as a criminal for speaking the truth, I never imagined that I would live to see our courts condemn the NSA's activities as unlawful and in the same ruling credit me for exposing them. And yet that day has arrived. And there is a petition for pardoning Edward Snowden. And so I'm going to leave that in this thread. I think it's tweetsforsnowden.org that's going on to try to get Donald Trump, if he's still president, or whoever is the president in a couple of months, to pardon Edward Snowden so that he can return to the United States. And if he's going to be forced to be subjected to a trial, to be subjected to a trial, the intelligence agencies are going to kill him after that. They're going to kill him after that, but to at least allow him to live the rest of his life as someone who allowed for this big snowball to start rolling down that hill and to lead us to the point where at least we now know what the U.S. government is doing for sure, that at least there's this ruling against them, and there's something to work with to have a right to privacy going forward in North America. Of course, here in Canada, we have our own battles to fight on that side, but it's important that the American context, that that battle is won for us to have a chance at being able to have similar victories happen here. So in any case, this is going kind of long enough. Uh, from the peanut gallery, we've got, what do I think of vaccines? I think they're very important. I think that the vaccine, there are many vaccines that are safe and effective at uh, reducing incidence of disease that here in Canada, many of them are given to children as part of our upbringing and that that is a good thing that there is an argument to be made for choosing what goes into your body, of course, but that it is worth considering that, for the most part, the vaccines in question that we deal with are vetted quite uh, heavily by Health Canada. And at least up until the Trudeau government, we could rely on Health Canada to be on the lookout for our health, especially with regards to vaccines. So uh, with that, though, I will end this show and check out our... Twitch stream. So I'm not seeing any suggestions of where to raid today. So let's see here. None of my follow channels are online. Uh, and I don't see anyone who's live that I can reliably count on to be free culture or creative commons. So I'm just going to close this stream right now. But other than that, if you've got the ability to financially support this particular show, I do. It is a listener supported show. So if you're interested in more, news and more guests and more uh, Creative Commons music or free culture music, definitely drop a dime in my subscribestar.com slash jeff-cliff. And with that, I'm going to leave with the goodbye song, and I'll see you all next week or whenever I finish editing this particular episode. I know I'm a couple of episodes behind right now, but uh, I will see you all then.
Thank <laughs> you. 